Dr. Choquette will now have 12 minutes of rebuttal, after which time we will be taking a break. Dr. Choquette, your rebuttal, sir. Well, I'm amazed. I'd really, really honestly expect it much better. And I'm very disappointed. Okay, can't hear me again. Well, it's in his favor. <laughs> um, Dr. Brown started off by saying that all the passages that I mentioned, not one of them refers to the Messiah, mentions the Messiah. And interestingly enough, his very last sentence was the exact opposite. Once the second coming comes, then all these things that Rabbi Shochet spoke about will come to pass. Now, is it messianic or is it not messianic? Give me a break. You can't have it both ways. For that matter, if any of all those passages are not messianic, then where do you have messianic in the whole Bible? There, isn't, there are no other passages speaking about Messiah. The word Mashiach, relating to Messiah, is not mentioned once in the Bible. That's a later rabbinic concept. The word Mashiach simply means anointed. Anointed can mean a high priest, anointed can mean a Gentile king. As I say, I refer to Cyrus, king of Persia, as the anointed. Every king that is anointed, and we refer to Mashiach simply, to the Messiah as Mashiach, simply because he will be the anointed king. There is no significance to the word Mashiach. And as a matter of fact, therefore, also the reference to Daniel that he brought has absolutely nothing to do with the Messiah. It's not the Messianic passage. It's talking the anointed will be cut off, meaning the high priest who is the anointed one. And since already speaking about those two references he put there together, in Jonah there is not one single reference to Messianic aspects whatsoever. All that just as an introduction. Secondly, the onus of proof is not on me. I don't have to disprove that Jesus is the Messiah. Anybody could claim that he is the Messiah. The onus of proof is on the one who claims that Jesus or anybody else, Shabzai Tzvi or Bar Kochba or David Koresh or Jimmy Jones or I don't care who, that they are the Messiah. It's up to them to offer proof. Dr. Brown has not offered one single passage, one single argument, one single point that Jesus has anything to do with Messiah or anything to do with the Old Testament. He spent a lot of time on the Talmud, on the rabbis, the oral Torah. We are not discussing the Talmud. We are not discussing the oral Torah tonight. What are you bringing that in for? As the moderator already said at the beginning, we are dealing now strictly with the biblical prophecies and the biblical concepts of what we are talking about Mashiach. So who gives a hoot what the rabbis say, what the rabbis don't say, what the rabbis believe or what the rabbis don't believe? And who gives a hoot that there have been some Jews who praised Jesus, especially a fellow like Martin Buber, who was intermarried, a totally secular Jew, who didn't believe in anything, who led no religious life whatsoever, and likewise Joseph Klausner. Leo Beck, you want to know about Rabbi Beck? You want to know one of the sharpest criticisms against Christianity? Read Leo Beck's article, Romantic Religion, in his book, Judaism and Christianity. Even I have never said things as sharp and as provocative as he says there. Indeed, it's mainly geared against Paul, but as sharp as you can possibly be. For that matter, to quote to me some liberal rabbis, reform rabbis, or secular Jews altogether, or even Lapidus, whoever he is, and never heard of the man, and couldn't care less who he is, that is like me quoting to him a whole bunch of left-wing uh, Christian theologians and saying, look what they have to say about the New Testament. Look what they have to say about Jesus. I'm sure that Dr. Brown will say, well, they are not speaking for Christianity. This has nothing to do with traditional Christianity or historical Christianity or religious Christianity. It's irrelevant what they say. Well, thank you very much. I return the compliment. Um, for that matter, with regards to the old law and the uh, rabbinic tradition, he says that Jesus rejected that. Oh, yeah? We'll have a look at Luke chapter 23, verses 2 and 3. The scribes and the Pharisees, that's the rabbis, the rabbinic tradition. Sit in the seat of Moses. They are the successors to Moses. Therefore, do and observe all the things they tell you. That's Jesus speaking. He's not talking about the Torah. 
He's not talking about Moses. He's not talking about the biblical tradition. He's talking about the scribes and the Pharisees because he realized being a Jew that there is an unbroken chain of tradition. Without the rabbis, without the scribes and the Pharisees, not a single word in the five books of Moses makes sense. Not one of them. Not one commandment. Take the first Jewish commandment, circumcision. What does circumcision mean? What do you have to circumcise? What do you have to cut off? Tip of your nose? Tip of your ears? Tip of your fingers? There is not one word anywhere in the Bible where you will find the definition of circumcision. Likewise, there is not one word in the Bible anywhere where you find the definition of what working on the Sabbath means. Therefore, for our Dr. Brown to glibly say, where is the rubbing of corn regarded as a capital offense of desecrating the Sabbath? Well, in the same source where you get the definition of what is called working on, Sabbath, on the Sabbath. So, either you take it or you don't take it. But you can't just say glibly, well, who cares about this? You've, you left it here at 12 minutes. Does that mean I have perpetual 12 minutes? He's giving you time down there. Huh? I would like to know where I am, huh? 6.35. 6.35. I thought it was uh, 8.35, but anyway. <laughs> um, back to about the honoring parents which he says he heard me say in a lecture in Australia, he had one advantage over me, he had seen some of my videos or some of my tapes, I've never heard of Dr. Brown except by word of mouth, one or two things. I'm, I'm not talking about uh, he who hates not his father and his mother, etc., etc., shall not be my disciple. That's the passage I was referring there to. I'm referring to example Matthew chapter 12. Uh, verse 46 on, while he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without deciding to speak with him. And one of his disciples says, your mother and your brother stand outside, they want to come in. But he answered them, who is my mother? And who are my brothers? That's honoring your mother. And if that is not enough, uh, go on to Matthew chapter 23, verse 9, and call no man your father upon the earth, for none is your father, but one is your father, the one in your heaven. Matthew chapter 8, verse 21. Another of his disciples said to him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. He wants him to go along with Jesus. He says, Lord, just give me a minute. There is a commandment in the Torah that you have to bury your dead, let alone your parents. You have an, an obligation to that. And what did Jesus answer him? He said to him, follow me and let the dead bury the dead. Let him bury himself, the corpse there. And so I have one or two more passages of a similar nature. So therefore I'm not referring to what uh, is talking there about hate your mother and hate your father, which could possibly be interpreted. But now we get to the real essence. It was a very dazzling performance by Dr. Brown. And that dazzling performance, quoting, citing right, left and center, very impressive, very erudite, but the man hasn't said a word. He has violated the principle of this whole debate. Simply by stating, well, what does he mean? He says the passage which I quoted were out of context. He has not shown one being out of context. But then he said like this, but what did Paul mean? And what does he say? Let us see what he said. I took the simple meaning of what it says there. Then comes Dr. Brown and says, oh, no, no, no. Don't take what it says there. You have to understand what he says. Well, I'm willing to grant him that. I'm very generous. However, that's the crux of our whole argument. The crux of the argument is the concept of interpretation. If you take the Bible, our Bible, the Jewish Bible, Dr. Brown and I agree is the word of God. There is this Jewish tradition, inviolable, you're stuck with it whether you like it or not. There may be passages in the Jewish Bible which I may wonder about, being a 20th century modern philosopher, etc., etc., but if I believe that this is the word of God, I'm stuck with it. The New Testament, I am not stuck with. That we both agree about the Bible, the Jewish Bible. The New Testament is a book that some people have introduced and now claim this is the word of God. The onus of proof is on them. And therefore, you cannot just come and say, well, I, first of all, he takes for granted it is from God. Secondly, he takes for granted this is the interpretation or that is the interpretation. Does he realize that the Roman Catholics do not interpret the way he does? Does he realize that the Anglicans, what you call the Episcopalians, don't interpret the way he does? That the Lutherans don't interpret the way he does? That the Christian scientists don't interpret the way he does? That the Baha'i don't interpret the way he does? That the Seventh-day Adventists don't interpret the way he does? So what is he saying? Well, that's my interpretation. Good luck with your interpretation. But that's exactly the point. That's your interpretation. And your interpretation, live and be happy with it. 
But when you go and try and missionize and evangelize, you are coming to your victims and you are telling them, this is the word of God. This is what God said to the apostles. This is what God said to Jesus. This is what the New Testament means. The onus of proof is on you. Your interpretation, for you it's good enough, be happy with it. But it has no more value and it has no more validity than Reverend Moon's interpretation of the New Testament, than David Korsh's interpretation of the New Testament, than Jimmy Jones' interpretation of the New Testament, or any crackpot that may come. I don't know about Phoenix, but in Toronto we have a special institution for people who claim that God speaks to them all the time and who bring messages from God. Every one of them would pass a lie detector test without a doubt in my mind. But do I accept them? The answer is very simply no. Why should I? Prove it to me. You can't prove it to me, then forget it. They are going to give me interpretation. God says this, God says that. So at best, at the very best, what Dr. Brown has offered us is his private personal interpretation of how he reads the Jewish Bible, his private personal interpretation how he reads the New Testament, and I say good luck to him, but remember that's your private leap of faith. That's your private religion. This has nothing to do with an objective reading of it. This doesn't stand a chance in any court of law, in any rational argument, in any rational logical debate. And that's the crux of the whole thing. I stick with that which we know to be true, I obviously have my interpretation, which is the Talmud. I didn't quote the Talmudic interpretation because I realized he doesn't accept them. That's why I stay away from that. So let's stick to that which we agree. And that is what he has failed to do. So he tries to bedazzle us with all kinds of irrelevant ad hominem and ad populum arguments about this and that. And like, for example, the Kornim. That's such an absurdity, such nonsense. The word Kornim does not just mean priest. The word Kornim in Hebrew means the one who is holding an office. The whole Jewish people are called Kornim the kingdom of priests. There are Kohen Baal, those who serve Baal. King David was not a Kohen. When it says to Bnei David Kohenim, it simply means that they were also serving a certain function. Any function that you serve in, I can call you a Kohen in that concept. So there are so many total distortions, misinterpretations, and basically, personal, private interpretations. We are not interested in those. Tell me what it says. Tell me what you can show that it says. And for the rest, you haven't said anything. Thank you, Dr. Shochet. We will now take, I almost hesitate to say this, a five-minute break. Please try to be courteous to those in front of you at the door as you leave the room if you need to do so. I will begin calling you back at exactly quarter till. Please be back in your seats. Thank you. <laughs>